actions mm-hmm. and personality. Peter R. Bregan, M.D., is called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful reform efforts. His scientific and educational work provide the foundation for modern criticism of drugs and ECT and lead the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His books include Talking Back to Prozac, Toxic Psychiatry, Medication Madness, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, and now Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. Welcome to the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. Hello, 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 my wonderful audience. Today is an exciting day for me. I am speaking to you from my home office. We moved in the last several months, and I've set up an entirely new equipment. I'm going to be asking, I am asking, asking uh, Jesse, our engineer, to get back to me and to tell me how this sounds. Sounds good in the earphones. I might need a little more gain or sensitivity uh, in terms of how I'm sounding, the message is, sounds great. And I've got the sensitivity uh, down, the gain way down. So I'm glad this is working. <clears throat> it's very, very exciting for me. It's the first of two steps. The next step is that I will be um, doing video from here. I'll be doing a uh, my own little like TV show eventually. And um, I'm not sure if I'll be using this room. I may be going up to uh, a more closed, dark room than my regular office space in the home. And when I say office space, I don't see patients or clients here. I, uh, I do all my legal work and all my book writing and everything here that I can. And it's a part of, uh, of a lifestyle change since uh, Ginger's mom, who's uh, 92, has come to live with us. Uh, We have, uh, at the same time, by chance, uh, bought a house, a new house nearer to town that's much too big for us. And then, wow, we have mom with us. So uh, we have our assistant here with us, too. And um, I will only be seeing patients at my regular office. Uh, So this is really a, a big change for me, a big lifestyle change. It's me opening up more to living in the exactly the way I want to. And it's uh, me, uh, me just being a little more adventuresome with my technology uh, and uh, doing lots of uh, new and um, interesting things. Um, let me just check and see if my guest is hooked up. Uh, uh, Richard, are you there? You, Peter. Oh, how do I sound? You're absolutely clean on the audio. Oh, that's fabulous. All right, well... Let me see. I got a few more things to chat about before I introduce uh, uh, one of the most innovative, uh, unique uh, guests that I have on uh, periodically because he's a source of information, the likes of which uh, literally, I don't know that it exists anywhere else. Let me remind you that we are uh, taking callers. That's a new format. Um and um, it's, it's just a wonderful opportunity uh, for you all to, to talk with me, to exchange with me. We've had active listeners uh, uh, all the time. So, you know, it's, it's, the listener becomes my guest when you call in and when you ask me a question. And uh, my guest will have an opportunity to do that, too. And the way you call in is on 888-874-874. 4888 888-874-4888. And uh, in case you don't know uh, exactly where I'm coming from, uh, you're getting this on, on some, some sort of uh, link that doesn't give you a lot of information. This is the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. And it's every Wednesday at uh, 4 to 5 p.m. And you listen to it on uh, PRN. Dot FM, www.prnfm, and we have an archive. And um, you can also uh, email me and tell me stuff. And this email I only give out on the radio, and I respond to late, my radio listeners uh, 
to their overall impressions and individually to their impressions. And uh, in one case, I've invited one of my callers to come on and do an hour show. That's going to be a wonderful surprise. Uh, and the email is very simple, Bregan Live. Bregan Live at Hotmail.com. It's not called cool? Bregan Live at Hotmail.com. And you can email it to me and chat with me in that way. So uh, to, uh, not to make things too complicated, you listen to us on PRNFM Live. And uh, while you're listening, you can call in on 888-874-4888. We recommend that people start calling in early, even though we may not take callers for 20 minutes or half an hour. Call in early, line up. We usually get a few. Occasionally, we can't answer them all. Some, most of the time, uh, we can. Um, let me think as I just go through my mind on anything else I want to cover. Uh, I'm looking out a huge bay window at snow falling and birds are jumping on my bird feeders and there's a woods in the background. It's, it's just a, a wonderful place to be talking from and talking to you, my wonderful guests, because you can call in and be my guests. Um, my official guest today is Richard Lawhern. Uh, Dr. Richard Lawhern, you've heard him before. He is a self-made expert who became involved in the issues of opioid addiction and abuse and who comes with a unique perspective. Uh, we were talking today on the phone about um, the opioids versus the psychiatric drugs, and he and I are in agreement that, in fact, when prescribed by a physician who is reasonably sensible, opioids and opiate drugs, painkillers that have an addictive potential, are much safer drugs than psychiatric drugs given routinely and given according to the existing standards. Psychiatric drugs disrupt multiple neurotransmitters even if, like the SSRIs, they claim to primarily hit selectively serotonin, they can't do it. They hit all kinds of neurotransmitters interacting with serotonin. And my experience is that you can't generally uh, talk to somebody, meet somebody, interview somebody who is taking a sufficient amount of pain medicine uh, well uh, well guided by a physician you can't see emotional mental pathology being produced from the opiates the way you can from practically every psychiatric drug including the benzodiazepines the mood stabilizers the stimulants the antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs and so on and the evidence for persistent harm to the brain is much greater in my experience and and perhaps Richard Lawhern, uh, his, his friends call him Red, perhaps uh, Dr. Lawhern will be able to elaborate more on that from his perspective, but the studies are much greater from, from harm from opiate, from, excuse me, from the psychiatric drugs, the atrophy of the brain and so on, the memory problems and learning problems than they are from reasonably prescribed um, opiate drugs. And Richard uh, Red Lawhern has some good new information with us. Last time he talked, to bring to us, last time we talked, he spoke about the uh, standards for prescribing that are attempting to be set uh, by the federal government and by the DEA Oh, and actually the CDC, you see, what's the CDC doing in there? I'm talking, I, my, out of my mouth comes the DEA, but it's the CDC that's been doing it. Standards which he challenged, he boldly challenged and found excessive and observed that it is not prescribing of these drugs that is causing the multiple catastrophic epidemic portion of deaths from overdose of opiates. So here we are. We're acknowledging at the start there is a real serious problem out there, folks, of good people, 
usually young people, good people, uh, dying from opiate overdose. And we need to deal with that, and we will deal with that today. But it's not coming from where you think. And with that interesting, I hope, intro from my new office, in my home, on my new equipment, a new mic, I introduce Dr. Richard Lawhern, who has his own institute. I'll let him tell you a little bit about that, and who has studied and researched this area as no one else I know. Welcome to the show, Richard. Well, thank you, Peter. And I hope I'm coming across clean audio, too. Yeah, very um, good. You sound good and relaxed and uh, just good. Go ahead. Well, we, we've chatted before and with, with your audience, and I thought I, today we might bring people up a little more up to date on what's going on with regard to the so-called opioid epidemic, and I do use the terms so-called strongly marked in quotes, because it's my view and that of quite a number of other medical or of, of more medically qualified people that... Uh, most of the U.S. dominant public conversation or narrative with regard to our opioid crisis is misdirected. And the policy that is being set from that narrative is not only wrong, much of it is fraudulent. So, yes, I am a very real critic, a very strong critic of the 2016 opioid prescribing guidelines. Because I've researched the background behind both the content of those guidelines and the process that was used uh, in generating them. And I've, I've found enough evidence of malfeasance and fraud that I've been led to, for, to file a formal complaint against the CDC with the Office of the Inspector General in the Department of Health and Human Services on grounds that the guidelines are not only scientifically wrong, but that some of the writers knew it when they wrote it, and that there has been gross misbehavior, malfeasance, and fraud on the part of the CDC in pursuing a guideline which has had absolutely horrendous impacts on pain patients and doctors and uh, literally people all across this country by the hundreds of thousands. Now, as we speak, there is something I owe your audience, and I'm careful about this. You, you and I have, have talked about this in our re previous interviews. I want to make it very clear. I am trained as an information analyst and an engineer. I got into this business 25 years ago, well, 22 years ago, when my wife came down as a chronic pain patient. And I got into it largely as an analyst of the medical literature, not as an MD. I do not have an MD degree. I've never practiced medicine. So in that sense, I'm almost a worse piece of news for people who are advocates against opioids than a doctor would be because I can't be shut up easily by people who can threaten me with a license uh, retraction, and that's happening all the time right now. Uh, what I do bring to this party, though, is a deep respect for, for data and for medical evidence and a deep connection with literally thousands of patients that I've interacted with over the last 20 years. Perhaps, actually, it's more like tens of thousands of patients now. I'm doing information work in social media and Twitter and Facebook. And the alliance, which I am, for which I am the director of research, has a daily footprint of about 200,000 people that we can touch in various media. Our mission uh, is basically to balance the narrative. We're called the Alliance for the Treatment of Intractable Pain, and we're trying to get the dominant narrative straightened out so that we can actually help patients find the treatment they need for either addiction or chronic pain. Now, as far as new news is concerned, other, other than my particular complaint, which I don't expect to hear much back from until March or so, if that, there is a brand new piece of news that pain patients all over the country need to hear, and I'll, I'll briefly read one small piece of that. It turns out that after two and a half years of muddling around 
the American Medical Association has finally published a very critical set of resolutions. And by critical, I mean both very important and highly critical from the perspective of uh, criticizing on principle the CDC guidelines. The uh, AMA House of Delegates just last week adopted a series of resolutions that call for restraint in implementing the CDC guideline, and particularly as that guideline applies and as the restraint would apply to the agency's maximum uh, recommended dose of 90 milligrams of morphine milligram equivalent units. So read the, this short paragraph. Resolved that our AMA will advocate that no entity should use morphine milligram equivalent thresholds as anything more than guidance. And physicians should not be subject to professional discipline, loss of board certification, loss of clinical privileges, criminal prosecution, civil liability, or other penalties or practice limitations solely for prescribing guidelines at a quantitative level above the MME thresholds found in the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids. Now, when you look at that and at the other resolutions that the AMA put forward, what you're getting in a polite way is the statement that the guidelines have been grossly misinterpreted and misapplied by just about every state regulatory authority or legislature that has had anything to say about maximum allowable dose levels or maximum allowable days of prescriptions that are authorized or prior restraint or just a raft of other subjects. AMA has finally come out much later than I think they should have and told the CDC, guys, you got it wrong. And all of the state and federal regulatory agencies that have taken your magical and unsupported numbers have also got it wrong, and they're harming patients. This is a really major potential uh, change and a positive change from the perspective of, of uh, chronic pain patients. We have seen in social media... And we have seen in reports in quite uh, accepted major media sources that literally hundreds, if not thousands, of doctors have been driven out of pain management practice in the last two, two and a half years. And with them, uh, many, many hospitals, many, many practices have arbitrarily limited the amount that they will prescribe for medications that are basically safe and reliable for, for many, literally, millions of patients. And that, that those outcomes have occurred as a result of four major, major errors of assumptions that are embedded in the CDC guidelines. As they were written, the guidelines basically took the attitude that we got a major opioid crisis that was caused by prescriptions that doctors gave to their patients. But when you look at the data that the CDC actually have generated and published, but never themselves put together, what you find out is that there is no relationship in the statistics, whatever, between rates of opioid prescribing by doctors versus rates of opioid-related overdose deaths from all sources. If you, put, if you plot the two kinds of rates on a single sheet, you get a shotgun pattern that shows absolutely no cause and effect whatever. So what we've got here is that the contribution of medically managed opioids prescribed and monitored by a doctor to our so-called opioid crisis is so small that it gets lost in the noise. You can't see it. It doesn't move the needle. But the CDC guidelines basically said, oh, we have a major problem on prescription, and we have to solve it by limiting the exposure of patients to the only pain therapies that work. That should be chilling to all of us. And I might add, I quite agree with your observation that having the CDC active in this field is a really, really unjustified involvement because they don't have the expertise to develop a practice standard or a practice guideline for the administration of any drug. 
That's FDA's job, and they and they are now gradually taking it over again. They, they're very active in trying to look at alternative measures. So, a second major uh, observation. Let, let, let's stop there for a minute and look at that, okay? Go. Just so folks can absorb it. You have so much information that it uh, takes a little absorbing. So, folks, the idea that doctors too freely giving out drugs to patients for pain, pain medications. We're talking about opioids, opiates and their derivatives, opioids. Uh, we're talking about um, hydrocodone. You know, we're talking about Oxycontin. We're uh, talking about uh, just a whole, whole bunch of drugs. And it just isn't true. That is, there isn't a correlation between overdose deaths if you look at those people, and they're having been given too much pain medication. These people are getting their drugs, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit maybe right now, because I want to tarry on this one, one big, big thing for a few minutes. So it, it's just a misnomer. Now, it's complicated, I think, because um, that doesn't mean people, and maybe Ray could address this, doesn't mean that people aren't at times getting too much medication and getting addicted to it and having a lot of trouble coming off. Let me, let me ask you about that. What about the idea that um, that when surgeons, for example, prescribe opiates for surgical pain recovery, that they should uh, only give a week or two and be very, very careful and that it's wrong for them to too reflexly just go on and continue them on that? Uh, is that a problem, but not the problem that leads to opiate overdoses and severe addiction. Can you make well, a yeah, kind and, of and fact, little have, for us? We have a couple of really excellent studies that were published by the Journal of the American Medical Association, in one case and the British Medical Journal in another. They went, the authors of these studies tried to, to, um, <clears throat> to investigate the relationship between the prescription of opioids for patients who had never had an opioid before to control pain after surgery versus the likelihood of a downstream diagnosis of opioid abuse disorder or, alternately, the possibility that opioids would continue to be prescribed and renewed for prolonged periods, like more than 10 times in a year, uh, or, excuse me, I guess it's more than 13 weeks or 10 times in a year. So, when those studies were reported out, each of them did comparison on over 650,000 medical records. And what they found was that uh, the, the natural rate, the background rate for the use of opioids in big populations for the control of pain, when surgery is not involved, is about 0.136%. And the when a surgery causes the patient to, to receive a prescription, the chance of a later opioid overdose, excuse me, a later opioid abuse problem as diagnosed by a doctor is less than 0.6%. And it's only weakly, uh, very weakly related to the, do the dose level that is prescribed for the control of pain. Now look at the other side of that. And when you look at the, the rates of prescription for opioids before and after surgery, and you look at the, the number of weeks where somebody is likely to get a renewal over and over and over again, the rate is about 0.69% um, at maximum for the most damaging kind of surgery there is, excuse me, I guess it is 0.69% for one of the most damaging kinds of surgery there is, and it is lower Richard, than that. Richard, even for, I'm for having a little trouble them. with the numbers. You're such an analyst. you got a I'm PhD sorry. in <laughs> okay. analysis. I've Here's got a new MD, and some folks don't have, just aren't used to this. So let me, let, me par, let me bring it down to sort of like a couple of simple questions. If you get a major surgery and you're prescribed opiates, um, how likely are you to end up uh, taking them regularly for years? Is that common or uncommon? 
It is, it is uncommon. It is less than 1% of all patients that go through surgery. Wow. All right. So there's really clear. Less than 1 in 100 people who go through major surgery end up taking uh, these drugs for long, long periods of time. So that's right. that's very, very clear. And if we were to look at uh, a, a a 17-year-old girl or a 25-year-old man who dies of an overdose, what's the likelihood of an opiate? What's the likelihood he got started on that by a doctor? Well, that's a little harder to determine, but we do have a pretty good idea in some states. When you look at uh, blood tox screening that is done on people who overdose, In places like the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, for instance, they did a full study on two years of data. They found that about 8% of all opioid overdose cases in their state could be traced to um, a combination of drugs, and that's important, both legal and illegal, that might have among that combination one Uh, medically prescribed or or typically medically used opioid. But when you look at even those numbers, when they went back into their prescription drug management uh, programs, among that, you know, narrow 8%, fewer than one in three had a current prescription. And what that tells us is that patients who are cut off from from, uh, uh, medical treatment of pain have a significantly increased possibility of death because they're being driven into the streets. And that's now being admitted by a number of medical authorities. It is a serious concern. I think we're having that as well from things like the New York State requirements, which uh, uh, prevent doctor shopping. Now, I'm not in favor of doctor shopping. It's it's an abuse of uh, doctors, abuse of the system, self-abuse by the individuals. But when people can't get drugs from doctors, then they end up getting worse stuff on the streets. I mean, that, that, that shows up in a lot of different ways. And, and in fact, fentanyl is, 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 is one of the real offenders, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, in terms of, um, there's a, of overdoses, there's an interest- and fentanyl is rarely given out by anybody after surgery. Is that, wouldn't you say so? Well, yeah, and more important, the fentanyl that's causing the deaths isn't the fentanyl that's used medically. It's manufactured in labs in Mexico and China and imported. There was a case in New York State, probably a year or more ago, where a courier with a briefcase was found to have a briefcase full of fentanyl, and the number of doses that that could have supported would have been enough to kill 10 million people in a briefcase. Wow. Yeah, but let me come back to, uh, because I think it is important um, that, uh, that doctors themselves are not necessarily giving out a lot of fentanyl. I think it's more important than you were suggesting, because the issue is, what's the origin? So if doctors were giving fentanyl, and then they got it from China and it wasn't quite the same and all that. We, we, they still would have gotten hooked by doctors. But I don't that think doctors happen. are giving out all that much fentanyl, which is just there hugely was- more potent than um, other uh, opioids and which was really de- supposed to be given to chronic cancer patients who were facing, facing death to ease their pain. Uh, am I right about that? I need to kind well, of check with you because you... There's a couple of nuances there, and we'll be careful about it. Fentanyl most often is used in combination with other drugs during surgery. And it is used in in relatively rare cases in a patch where the dose is regulated for people who have had problems getting relief from anything else. So in in that way, fentanyl is pretty much medically a court of last resort, if you will. However, here's the interesting thing. The DEA has so restricted prescribing and use of fentanyl and other opioids that hospitals are having to defer surgeries because they can't get anesthetics to control pain. And that's happening I mean, all they across actually the can't U.S. Get them physically, due to the control uh, that the DEA would have to do that, that the DEA, the DEA is, is doing restricting on manufacturers. Production. Yeah, the DEA is restricting production quotas 
among manufacturers. In fact, they wow. have they have gone on on record with, and I think I believe this is a criteria that's applying this year. They've gone on record with uh, saying that they reserve the right to restrict production on any drug that has been shown capable of diversion, as if they knew how to measure it. They don't. So what we get here is a DEA that has gone absolutely freaking crazy, pardon my French, um, over the idea that we can control the opioid epidemic if we only cut off enough patients from care. That's what it really amounts to, even though DEA doesn't, doesn't acknowledge that. And doctors are scared of losing their licenses if they prescribe enough of any uh, uh, medication, including fentanyl, but by all means, the, including the others as well, if they prescribe enough to control a patient's pain, and that enough happens to be above 90 morphine milligram equivalent, they're afraid of being subjected to scrutiny, being investigated, having their reputations ruined, and basically being just being investigated can ruin a practice. And DEA uses that to threaten doctors. They use it to try to force down prescribing rates. And state regulators are doing the same nonsense. But what we just heard from the AMA says, "Uh uh-uh, fellas, that's not acceptable. That's wrong. And yet they're still doing it. Yeah, I I remember way back when um, Ritalin prescriptions started skyrocketing. They had more problems with diversion. And so for like one month or so, the DEA cut back on the production, uh, the allowed production of of some of the stimulant drugs. And of course, there was a a hue and cry about not allowing the children to get their medication. And the the DEA caved in immediately and were poisoning the brains with, with no significance that I know know of restriction on any of the production of the amphetamines and the Ritalin-like drugs. Uh, so there's something particularly driving them in, in this direction. Uh, and folks, we're talking to Richard Lawher. Let me remind uh, you of that, uh, who really knows more about this than anybody I know, else I know. And um, do call in. We, um, We'd love to hear questions about uh, about this subject. We we do have callers on on other subjects, which we will also get to. But uh, I know this isn't the uh, the most common subject we have on the air, or maybe or perhaps listeners are interested in. But it's a study in the way things get horribly misdirected by the government and its massive control, which it n- never seems to use properly when it comes to to psychoactive substances, it always seems to be on a wrong side of uh, of these issues. So we're going, we're having more and more trouble people getting pain medicines that they need, and um, and they make so freely available psychiatric drugs, which not classically addictive necessarily, can be harder to get off of than opiates at times, and and more damaging. Um, and let me also remind folks who, who uh, I, I, I missed out on my usual uh, uh, habit of an announcing the day. I don't think I said it's uh, <laughs> November uh, 21st. It's the day before Thanksgiving and happy Thanksgiving. And uh, if, uh, if when you're listening, it's uh, not November 21st, you know, it's a replay and you can't call in. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but but you know, let's go back um, with with uh, Richard and and um, Dr. Richard Lawhern and and talk some more. By the way, how can they easily get a hold of you, folks? How can they call you most easily? Yeah, or get or get in touch with you. They're getting in touch with us, uh, and for your readers, um, you can among uh, well two ways. First of all, you can look up on Google the Alliance for the treatment of intractable pain. That's the organization that I'm a part of. And you can also find me, and I shudder to give this out, but I'm going to anyway. You can find me personally at lawhern at hotmail.com. And my name is spelled L-A-W-H-E-R-N. I can route you to other people in our alliance who will help you with particular issues. 
uh, notably palliative care and, and some of the issues that we're having with individual states that where we're trying to, to lobby with state regulators. And we have a lot of activity that's trying to change the legislative uh, agenda. You know, there, there's a real horror case here that I'll put out as one illustration of the very thing you're talking about on government, government overreach. The state of Oregon has a group of people in their Department of Health who are trying to outlaw the use of opioids outright for chronic pain for all of their Medicare patients. They're trying to force people who are already taking Medicare uh, opioids to be tapered down to zero within one year in all of their Medicare patients, and that's, you know, many tens of thousands. And they're doing it on the basis of the assumption that opioids are dangerous when prescribed, and the reality is nothing but that. And they don't want to hear the alternatives because guess what? The people on the commission that are doing this nonsense are people who stand to benefit by being able to deliver alternatives, they claim, like um, cognitive uh, behavior therapy as a substitute for opioids. And uh, if you want to talk about something that's outright evil, that one is it. Um, Hello. My my dog is... I hear you. Yeah, bang, bang. So we're, we're active at the state level, basically contradicting the instinct on the part of government regulators and others who stand to benefit financially. I would think to that drive the bigger lobbies, I mean, cognitive therapists don't have a big lobby or a lot of money. I would think it would be coming from the manufacturers of alternative drugs, including SSRI, antidepressants, and uh, just a variety of other alternative pain meds, which are, are really can mess up uh, a person's brain. Um, Yeah, well, I I don't say that it isn't happening, but that's a piece of this problem I don't see because we're we're an all-volunteer outfit. The Alliance doesn't get a dime from anybody, and we don't work with anybody else who does. So you just don't have that that particular data. Maybe maybe somebody else will start developing it. I wanted to say something, though, about alternative treatments of pain. Um, I'm not sure that that we sh- I don't take the stand that there are no alternative treatments of pain for, um, uh, you know, for people. Um, uh, certainly, uh, uh, um, good uh, rehabilitation experts, people who who know treatments of the bones and the joints, and uh, can really help people with pain. I've had I've had that experience myself. Um, physical physical therapists can uh, can do things Peter. that will relieve pain. So I, Peter, I, I hope I you're not going that? in that direction. That there are no other um, approaches to pain. And I think those those may get overlooked. But uh, other than that, I'm in such fundamental agreement with you. But what about that, Rich? I think I think you're going yeah. too far when you say there are no other okay. Okay. effective. Yeah, and people get help from acupuncture for pain and. Um, but, well, but really, definitively, um, uh, a good physical therapist can often help with pain, sometimes not. Well, you're, I just want you to, re- would you respond to that? Sure, Give me a favor. sure, absolutely. And, and we need to be balanced in what we understand about that and what we claim about that. It turns out that uh, Stephen Nado, MD, and myself published the lead art, uh, edit, editorial in practical pain management for the month of October on exactly that subject. And what we did was we did a deep look at uh, a published, what's called a systematic outcomes review that the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality did. They put together something published last June, looking at non-invasive, non uh, pharmacological, in other words, non-drug remedies that included acupuncture and physical therapy and various types of meditation and quite a large number of other really non-opioid looks at this thing or non-opioid uh, ma- uh, therapies for this thing. What we basically find in that literature is that, yes, by all means, there are, uh, opioids are not the the, um, approach of first choice in dealing with pain. Anti-inflammatory drugs probably are. When they work, they can often be administered under reasonably careful management for years and be very effective. 
um, some of the um, off-label uses of uh, anti-seizure drugs are very helpful for some people, particularly with neuropathy. And we also know that we can help patients to get better control of their moods and better control of depression with a lot of the alternative techniques, either uh, drug-related or non-drug-related. Physical therapy is very helpful if it was paid for by insurance, which mostly it isn't. Or if it is, it's only once a month. Um, you know, various kinds of therapies... So involved. we're in agreement then that in particular physical therapy is, when done properly, which is always, again, hard to find, is, is a very important alternative. Absolutely. If it were funded good, by good. insurance, it's not. So you got you got to you got to let let that out a little bit because you you come you were coming across a, 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 a very strongly that that it was the only I think the only alternative. By the way, I, I think that uh, that opiates in moderate use are probably safer often than the NSAIDs um, because the NSAIDs they can are be for some terrible. patients. The NSAIDs have a, have a regrettable uh, habit of putting people in a hospital with liver toxicity or cardiac problems when they're used for a long time at either maximum or above maximum recommended dose. They can be dangerous. Yeah, get, get about 1,500 because, deaths um, a year from that. They, also, gastrointestinal issues, very common Absolutely. with the NSAIDs. In fact, the Gerontology Association... Uh, specifically addressing me, I think, said that people over 80 should never take NSAIDs. And, um, and so, and I mean, a- we're told, we're, the, you know, the opiates are, are not the terrible drug they're made out to be often. And I do think they're made out to be that way in the interest of a lot of other drugs, which often are, are more, uh, more harmful. The opiates are addictive, they become street drugs, they get involved in terrible, complex situations. But I think I think that uh, Dr. Richard Lawhorn is basically fundamentally right about uh, the fact that this is not originating from, from over-prescription. L- let me ask you, Richard, and then I actually, in a couple of minutes, I, we, I want to take a caller who specifically wants to talk about alternative medical treatments. Um, let me see what she has to say. But um, say something, so because I'm sure people are wondering, you know, what, what do you feel is the cause of these, uh, this tragic epidemic we're experiencing of opioid uh, deaths? What we have, and this is a term you'll see in the literature if you dig for it, what we have is a crisis in social disintegration and despair. The people who are most vulnerable to addiction tend to be young males in economically stressed uh, areas of the country, particularly at the Rust Belt and inner cities. They tend to be... Uh, they tend, tend to have problems of various kinds that we can call mental health related. But chronic pain patients aren't that population. If, a, if the average uh, chronic pain patient is a woman in her 40s or older, and if her life is stable enough to see a doctor on a regular basis for pain, she's almost never going to be an opioid abuser. The other thing that gets really, really apparent here, if prescribing was, quote, the problem, which it is not, we would expect to see higher rates of mortality in populations with, that are prescribed more opioids. But we don't. That isn't anywhere in the, in the, in the demonstrated record. In the, the CDC's record itself, what they tell us is that the rate of prescription for uh, older people above age 50 is 250 percent that of young adults and youth, but the rate of overdose deaths in young adults and youth is six times higher than in seniors. So what we have is the, the, the demographics don't support yeah. the narrative. Yeah, let me interrupt a minute because again, uh, uh, figures can all, you know a little hard to sort of digest as your mind is going so so fast with them and. And, and, you know, it's common sense uh, what Richard's saying that, uh, you know, young people, 
don't have a lot of pain syndromes. They don't end up getting a lot of opioids from doctors, but they are among, they are the main demographic and they're not coming out of getting chronic opioid treatment from doctors. They're coming out of the crises that our young people are going through in America, which is a, another whole subject. And it makes me think I should maybe spend a session on that by myself or with somebody. I should do that, talking about just how tough it is to be a young person in America today. It's just incredibly Absolutely. difficult. So um, whereas the whether older folks like me who are uh, subject to are much, much more likely to have pain syndromes. We get chronic uh, arthritis. We, we get back problems. We get knee problems and so on and so forth. We get problems I never heard of before I became an older person. And and yet when we're treated with opioids, we don't tend to, to go in that direction. And we almost never overdose and kill ourselves with mixes of opioids. A fair statement? Yeah, and I'll add one more to it if I might. You don't unless you're denied pain treatment. And we're now seeing something from the CDC that's really alarming, and that is that 8.5% of all suicide victims have a history of chronic pain. But they are not overdosing on the drugs that were prescribed to them. They're overdosing on the drugs they get in the street because their doctors won't treat them. Yeah, I really believe that. Richard, let's take a deep breath. And again, we're talking to Richard Lawhorn, um, L-A-W-H-E-R-N. And um, let me take a caller, uh, Maggie, um, uh, if we might. Um, Maggie, are you there in Idaho? I am. Thank Hi, you. Hi, Maggie. Are you a first-time Hi. caller? I can't remember. I'm a first-time caller. Have Actually, you listened to the show before? I have not. Oh, well, um, so you can't tell me whether I'm sounding different on the new microphone in the new office. <laughs> no, so, uh, I couldn't. How did you get to the show? Well, I'm a member of several groups on um, the Internet or Facebook. Um, actually, I follow Dr. Lahern, and it's only been recently that I've discovered these groups. I have kind of suffered in silence or um, by myself trying to get through uh, my care and and get my treatment or, you know, get back to my treatment. Um, I'm sorry. Um, So I discovered these groups about two months ago. So so you're here through, through Dr. Lohern. Well, Dr. Lawhorn, Don't Punish Pain Patients. Um, I'm a big advocate of Don't Punish Pain Patients. They're Mm -hmm. doing things, too, trying to spread the word. The thing is, a a chronic, well, a pain patient that has an injury or a disease uh, that is suffering um, is isolated, especially when their medication is taken away from them. And, uh, Maggie, do you have we, a personal experience that you wish to share with us? You don't have to. Well, I certainly would because, um, and it's a long one, but I've got some notes so I can kind of condense it down. Yeah, um, try it try without even like, your notes to, uh, we're near the end of the hour, and I have one other caller okay. I'd like to get in. Um, okay. Just tell well, us briefly, um, you know, in a few sentences, what happened to you? Well, 1993 injury, I was a single parent with children, uh, working, very productive citizen. Um, I was injured and went on naysayers and antidepressants, and I was was in a lot of pain. It took two years to get into surgery. Then I was diagnosed with failed back surgery. My... L4-5 disc was ruptured, and then after surgery, they discovered that the discs above and below were also torn. So basically, it just made my my life was not going to be the same again. I was going to live with 
pain the rest of my life is exactly what I was told. Um, I went through, uh, I've been through several treatment centers. I went to methadone first, and that was a nightmare. It didn't work for me. Um, but then Methadone I as on, a, uh, a help in coming off the opiates or as an opiate for your pain? And as an opioid for my pain. Okay. That's common. And Yeah, it's and, probably not as good as the regular drugs. Uh, well, it didn't have, it, it ended up, uh, I ended up having blackouts. So I ended up getting taken off of that. And then I went to fentanyl and they pretty much abandoned me. The medical community abandoned me. And the internet was fairly new, and I met this Maggie, doctor. Maggie, what does that mean? What are you saying? The medical community abandoned you. Well, they diagnosed me with failed back surgery syndrome. Um, there wasn't nothing. There wasn't anything they could do with me. They weren't going to be but, able to control my. Were pain. they providing you enough drugs to give you relief? Um. Well. At that point, they weren't. In 2001, I went to a wonderful clinic, a, a interventional pain treatment center for six months. And uh, a physician uh, that has been knocked out by this political mess um, turned my life around where I was able to be employed and work and buy a house. Um, it was wonderful. My life changed. Now, um, at what did clinic, he do for I you? Learned, what was done for you, Maggie, that changed your life? Well, I um, attended classes Monday through Friday. Um, no, no, I mean, what was done eat, for your pain? What did the doctor do? Oh, it got it into in control, and I was implanted with a a pump, a pain pump. So you got adequate pain treatment, and that changed your life. Yes, and I also learned and, more about my disease, and uh, I integrated physical therapy and meditation and all these things that, that go along with having an opioid uh, to manage your pain. You do have to have something besides just the, the opioid. And, yeah. and Maggie? That's kind of... Hmm. Maggie, could I try something with you just a little bit here? I'd like to, to sure. pose a question so we can do this in the interest of time. Certainly. Would I be correct in, in believing that after you had this experience of much better control of pain and better quality of life, that at some point a doctor told you he could no longer prescribe for you? Exactly. Um Let's, let's cut it real short. Let's say four years ago, I was abruptly taken off and, and went through immediate withdrawals from an intrafecal drug without any support. Many visits to the emergency room, and they just pushed me out the door. Okay, now let me, let me build on that with you, if I might, so for, uh, for Peter. This is a story I have heard in various forms literally hundreds of times in the last three years. This is a common occurrence. The desertion of patients and the labeling of them as drug seekers by people, medical people who should know better has been common, and it is a response directly to the regulatory environment. The right. doctors are let, afraid let of losing their to licenses. Maggie, because you're, uh, you sound like a success story at this point. Do you not feel that you are getting exactly well, what you need? I just recently, um, and I think uh, these groups have provided me the information, advocacy, to discuss with my physician that this is wrong because uh, I did find a doctor finally that would take me on, but only at a very limited amount of medication. And recently I had surgery, and they discovered that my pain just went really wild. It really, I was crashing emotionally and physically, and they've started increasing my medication. So I feel like there's some hope, but... Um, I went, the last four years have been a pure everyday hell. Yeah. I've had so, about a you know, week 
of being so able to what sleep. What Richard was saying is correct that the doctor that helped you so much, he had to stop. Mm-hmm. Is that what happened? He had what? The doctor, the doctor who helped, who helped you, you so much and you got to back to school and were working. That that was stopped. Um. Yes, uh, his treatment was totally abruptly uh, stopped. stopped. Do you have yes. any idea why? I mean, what a catastrophe. Do you have any idea why? Well, that was one, one thing I w- wanted to get to. You're drawing that out of me. Is When I came out of that treatment center and came back to Idaho, doctors didn't want to follow what this, this treatment plan, okay. this medical study that had I... been done for six months. They wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to prescribe their own medications and have me, because in that way they could make money off injections and steroids and and you name it. Okay? So you couldn't get anybody to continue the good treatment you were having at a treatment center. It was always a battle. How are you doing now, Maggie? And and then I'll need need to say goodbye. Okay. Uh, Um, uh, But you can call back later. Whether oh, or not uh, Richard is on and tell us how things are going on another occasion. But h- how are things going for you right now? I think they look promising. I do want to say I totally, um, I think Richard has a voice that relays what patients are going through. Yeah. Um, I really do. And and I wanted to agree with him. These um, alternative medical treatments to take us off our opioids and just say, yeah. oh, well, you know, do this. We've been through that, but that's a complementary yeah. form with the opioids to keep us being contributing members of society. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to ask Richard to talk with you. I lost the guest that I wanted to keep on, and he had an ge- important general question. If, you're, if he still happens to be listening, call on... Uh, the uh, open open lines uh, uh, Wednesday, which will be next week, and um, it's my live talk on November twenty eighth, where all I do is take talk callers. So, um, if you're still listening, I apologize for not being able to get you. Maggie's uh, issues are so so uh, germane to the show today. Um, uh, Richard, uh, let me uh, have you chat with her briefly, and then we'll be ending very soon. Okay. We are ending uh, now. Um, okay. uh, two words, Richard, or a sentence. Give us a sentence in response, if you will. Not a worry. Um, it's been a useful show. Maggie's experience is very common, and we are hopeful that we're going to see some major changes because of the change of direction that the AMA has started. But it's going to be a long battle uphill even now. Yeah. Well, thank you for calling in, and, and Richard Lord, you're a fount of information. I love the way the show went and all the subjects we covered, and I hope it's been useful to other people. Maybe you can give me feedback at breganlive at hotmail.com, and thanks to PRN. Bye-bye, folks. Bye-bye, Richard.